Thank you, Rachel. <coughs> Hi. Uh, when I was asked to do this several weeks ago, I was kind of wondering uh, what are we going to talk about because um, our project, the Bride Project, which is the Bride River in North Cork as opposed to Paddy's uh, River here in the city. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, our, our, as, as the name suggests, biodiversity, regeneration in a daring environment, it's very much about biodiversity. Um, but as I began to look at it, we, you know, quite a, a few of our measures are linked to flood prevention or flood control. So hopefully I can um, persuade you of that as I go along. So the Bride Project, it's an EIP, a European Innovation Partnership for Agriculture. Um, there are quite a few e EIPs, this is based on the ar agricultural one. And uh, as it says, a new approach to uh, research and innovation <coughs> in, in solving problems, environmental problems on land. Um, but not exclusively environmental and climate related. Um, so it's a novel way and hopefully w some of the ideas at least that we come up with uh, can be used on a wider, wider scale. The Bride Project came about w when uh, two colleagues and I, two farmers incidentally, which is what we were talking about earlier on, and that's a key to, well, so far get it getting established. I won't say success yet because we're in the very early stages. But two of my colleagues, Donald Sheehan from Castle Lyons, who actually lives in the Bride Valley, and Paul Moore, both colleagues, uh, uh, friends that we, we, we were Birdwatch Ireland members and just got together and started saying, what can we do about uh, the problems of, in of intensive agriculture? And most of the environmental measures in Ireland, say reps and gloss, etc., are aimed at <coughs> upland areas or you know, less intensive farmland, etc. And we just felt, these are the most productive parts of Ireland, uh, and I, I, I don't disagree with these, that high nature value map that was shown earlier on, but it's high nature value, um, but it's in generally, those high nature values er areas are generally in n extensive or non-intensive farmland, whereas the richest farmland, in my view, and I, this is trying to, to look at it from outside the box, if you like, which is capable of producing the highest agricultural return in terms of whether it be beef, dairy, tillage, etc. in our view, is also capable of producing the highest biodiversity return if it's properly managed. And I'd just like intensive agriculture to be looked at in, a, in a, you know, not to be forgotten and pushed aside, oh, let that to intensive farming. It can also produce very, very high levels of biodiversity, and that's, that's, our, that's one of our main beliefs. There's the Bride Valley. For those of you not familiar, um, you probably won't see there, uh, Fermoy is up here, and <coughs> it's, a, it's about 40 kilometers long. It's a tributary of the Blackwater. It's an SAC. It rises in the Nagel Mountains up here. <coughs> and it's a very interesting little, little river. Um, it flows into the Blackwater just west of Tallow. Uh, the hills to the north and south are red sandstone but the valley itself is limestone. So you get a nice contrasting um, vegetation structure and ecology as a result. The, the richest and the most intensive farming is done, needless to say, in, in the flat areas. <coughs> but, but it's also quite intensive, particularly from Rathcormac downwards on, on the hills. We launched the Bride Project only a year ago, so we're, you know, we're still barely up and running. Uh, we'd been putting it together, a bit bit by bit for about four years before, just literally writing notes on what, what we could do. Um, and the, the three of us, Paul Moore, Donald Sheehan and myself. And then we approached uh, two Chagask uh, ecologists, John Finn and Darrow Hulikon, and they helped us immensely in, in getting the application through, which we were notified in, in December 2017, so got up and running last year. So okay, I'm going to shoot, I don't have too many very Interesting pictures I'm a or photographs, unfortunately. Uh, that can be for the one in four or five years' time if you, if you invite me back. Um, we, what is it about? What are our measures? I suppose first and foremost, it's to preserve existing habitats. Uh, and that's very important uh, because there are still quite a few habitats left. Most farms, you just the, the primarily, the, the, main, the main habitat on most farms, intensive farms anyway, is the hedgerow. But you do have pockets of marshland, small woodland, etc. And these are all vitally important because you don't want to have to be recreating these if they already exist. Unfortunately, if had the Bride Project begun, say, 20 or, or even 40 years ago, we would have had a lot more of these habitats. 
it's absolutely astonishing to see what has disappeared. Or, and oftentimes you don't even see it. You're just told that used to be a marsh, that used to be a wood, etc. But you can see the, the drains uh, that drained the, uh, the, the marshland or the wet grassland, etc. And everything is just, you know, when I think of the Ireland, uh, I'm thinking about this talk quite a lot lately. I was in a conifer forest the other day, up in deep peat, and the drains were just going down straight into the stream. In farmland, it's the same thing. Any wet area, drain, drain, drain. <coughs> and of course, that's what farmers have to do, you know, uh, create land. That's, that's, that's what, and improve it. Um, and that's what they were advised to do, and that's what they were paid to do. Anyway, w uh, so anything that's left, we automatically try and cordon off. For those 45 to 50 farmers who are in the scheme, we, it'll end up being about 45. Uh, they're paid to do this, you know. It's, it, it, but not hugely. Nobody will, nobody will become a millionaire out of the Bride Project. And most of the participating farmers ha are happily engaged and are willing to do this. But there has to be some return for it. Because, and, and I don't have a problem with that. We're already subsidizing farmers to produce you know, vast quantities of dairy and beef and, well, not so much tillage in Ireland anymore. Uh, so, you know, if this, these services could be recognized, I think it will go a long way to, to solving biodiversity and even flooding problems down the road. Okay, uh, we preserve existing habitats. We try and enhance, improve, or restore existing habitats. We create new habitats. Already this year now, we've put in about four kilometers of hedgerow. We expect to quadruple that over the next two or three years. We've plant, we'll be planting or have planted close on 15 small woodlands. Now our woodlands are, are, because of the native woodland scheme, we're restricted to quarter acre woodlands or one tenth of a hectare. But these are lovely little val valuable pockets of, of woodland that will be, would not have been there beforehand in usually what's known as waste corners. Or, uh, and we, we're always, before any, anybody questions it, we would never plant uh, a habitat on an existing habitat, so to speak. It would have to be a kind of a, a waste or rocky area, shall we say, or you know, a little rushy corner of a field, but not on you know, a valuable area of wet grassland or anything like that. Another measure for tillage farmers, and we have, we have a few, it's mainly a dairying stroke beef valley, but there are quite a few tillage farmers there, there still, would be to retain winter stubble until late March. Uh, and that's an important measure for flooding or at least water quality. Because, you know, uh, with tillage, uh, uh, once the crop is harvested, many farmers just spray off, as they call it, uh, the, the, the weeds that are left in the crop. And it's plowed in, you know, late in the autumn, early winter. And that in itself, then, with increasing rainfall, uh, leads to a lot of erosion and runoff into the river. But we'll pay them to hold on to, these, to this tillage which is a vitally important habitat for a whole range of seed-eating bir seed birds, yellowhammer in particular, but skylark and a whole range of finches, etc. use these tillage uh, stubble fields in the winter. Um, we, again, we'll have field margins and pollinator plots. Uh, we, we're going to, we'll be paying farmers to bring out the, you have the hedge and then you have the margin. So uh, on most dairy field, dairy land, and beef land now, you'll have, to, you have uh, an electric fence going around the perimeter, which means that in, in most cases, and I say no, in most cases, not all, hedges are no longer nece necessarily there for stock proofing, which is what they were put in, in the, you know, as well as subdivision of the land. But many farmers will tell you now that a hedge is there for shelter, or it's there for primarily shelter as they see it. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily seen as stock proof anymore. Um, Anyway, that's an aside. I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Because uh, the electric fence is, is your effective stock proofing measure. Uh, we'll have a three meter riparian buffer strip. Gloss measures at, at the moment, I think, pay for a two meter. We can pay the farmer for an extra meter. If you, so just widen it again. And then there's a whole range of small but significant measures, such as targeted nest boxing, nest boxes for specific species. You know. Gloss measures, they usually just put up a whole load of, um, as we call them, tit boxes that enhance the local population of blue tits and grey tits, which are under no threat. Um, and so we end up with slightly higher numbers of blue tits and grey tits on gloss farms. Well, the, the declining species such as barn owl, <coughs> excuse me, stock dove, spotted flycatcher, etc., are being ignored. 
We'll specifically target any of these rare or declining species. Bat boxes in sheds, we're having a lot of success with that. We'll talk to you about that later, Paddy. Um, farm sheds that, you know, these new big um, metal sheeted structures are pretty useless for most species, except a few. Uh, but if you, if you make them a little bit more hospitable, we're finding that bats actually use them right through the winter. And it needs to be studied in more detail, but uh, a dairy shed or even a beef shed in the winter is actually quite an important habitat in itself because, you know, the slatted tanks, uh, there are huge numbers of insects living in those, probably a very few, few limited species, small flies, etc., that remain, that live right through the winter. And Donald Sheen in particular now has noticed that by putting up bat boxes in these sheds, he's getting continuous bat activity right throughout the winter. But it's just, a, as I say, there's a lot needs to be looked at. Uh, he, he's put up six little bat boxes in one of his sheds now, and five of them are being used by up to, I think it's 12 bats. Uh, and of several species, it's mainly Pipistrel, I think Soprano, but they've recorded several, several other species. That was something I forgot to mention too. We, we did have baseline surveys, and we're still continuing to an extent. We've, just to show the before and after, if you like, um, 30, Five of the farms had bird surveys, which won't reveal a huge amount, we suspect, except for a couple of species. We've had invertebrate studies carried out by Tom Gittings on 16 farms, and that will all be repeated at the end. And we've had bat surveys carried out by Isabel Abbott on, uh, I think, 30 of the farms. So we'll, we'll, we'll repeat all of these studies at the end of the project just to let's, let us know if, we, if we've achieved anything, and hopefully we will. We will. Um, there's uh, what we do then, we have a GIS map of each farm to try and identify the habitats basically. And as you can see, it's primarily hedgerows. This is along the Bride River here, so you have a riparian buffer strip as well. This would be an unusual farm though, having so much uh, river frontage, but a, you know, an important habitat. That's a very intensive dairy farm, by the way. We assign, which I think again is unique to our project, the farmyard is assigned as a habitat because just for birds alone you'll get five or six species in the farm will only live around the, the, the farmyard house sparrow feral pigeon starling etc um, so and bats as we're finding out increasingly so each habitat is, is is noted and you're either in the the red zone which means you've only got not to four percent biodiversity BMA, biodiversity, biodiversity Managed Area. The orange or yellow zone means you're in the 5 to 9% category. And the really good guys then are in the 10% plus. But it's our aim to try and get as many of the red, particularly the red guys, into the orange section or the orange section into the green over the course of the, the five years. This also has a bearing on their payments, those in the green zone will get a higher payment than those in the red zone. So it's an incentive for the farmer uh, to you know, bring in more habitat improvements over the course of the five years. Uh, these now, this I suppose, yeah, is probably one of the uh, very rare sites now in the Bride Valley, but little, little s segments of marshland. And the only reason that's still there is because they, it, it couldn't be drained. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Let's face it. And they'll tell you that. You know, and it, it's perfectly understandable. A farmer wants more land. You know, that's what they're there to do. Uh, they were paid to do that. They were encouraged to do that. That was EU policy and still is, um, as we heard earlier on. Um, but if these areas are absolutely vital oases of, of remnants, if you like, and, you know, they're, they're the areas that can provide the seed if you for, for future expansion of some species, not everything, of course. But even last year, and bear in mind now, we're dealing with farmers who are, shall we say, at least keyed in and um, environmentally aware. And there's some very, very big dairy farmers involved too, and that's, that's very encouraging. You know, it's not just hobby farmers, which we only have one or two. Um, the, all of our farms are commercial farms, and some of them are, are very large. But even with that number of farmers, we had two areas like this last year that were drained. And these were the guys who applied to come in to the scheme. But be why? Because last year was an exceptionally dry year, as you remember. Yeah. And it, it presented an opportunity to finally get that patch of bog that 
couldn't couldn't get in previous years because it had been too wet. So it's an ongoing battle, you know. It's 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 to try and this most farmers would refer to that as waste ground, wasteland, agriculturally culturally useless. So um, it's to try and put a value on these areas because the, these areas are, are just so important. And as we've primarily today's talk, they're the kind of areas that retain water, in, uh, you know, in, uh, on farmland much more so than your your agricultural field. And even the, the practice of intensive farming, the size of the tractors, now you've all seen them, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The land is being increasingly compacted, the soil is being compacted, it's affecting growth. There are, quite, there are two different studies going on at the moment in the Bride Valley and nationally on how to improve the soil because intensive farming damages the soil basically. So with compaction, rainwater is going to run off all the faster. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a vast range of issues that you could talk about in terms of how to, how to um, <coughs> alleviate the flooding situation on farmland. But holding on to these or creating them would be, would be certainly one way to go. Um, I'll just give you an example there. That's, we'll, we'll score each hedgerow on the, each farm. That would obviously be bottom of, you know, that would get a very poor sco score. But look, it's a hedge. You have to look at it from positively. You have to, you have to be positive when you're looking at uh, um, trying to improve biodiversity on farmland. It's much better, any hedge is better than no hedge, and I say that about trees as well. Any tree is better than no tree. Um, but th what, we, what we will try and do is encourage the farmer to hopefully end up with something more along those lines. You know, allow the hedge to grow, allow the trees to blossom. You're providing vast habitat there, they're hawthorn primarily. Um, for, for pollinating insects in the spring. Each of those flowers then will hopefully turn into a hawberry for the autumn. So, you know, it's just ongoing. Um, obviously, the, far the hedge has to be maintained. You can't let it go completely wild and rampant. So we do, I, and w nothing in our scheme is compulsory because as my two farmer friends said, that's the worst thing you can ever do to a farmer, say you must do this, you have to do that. Farmers that get higher, how shall we say, they're encouraged to, do, to, to, to go, go that little extra measure and the payments are higher accordingly then. So we would encourage side trimming of up to about two meters, but nothing, nothing beyond that to allow this canopy develop. But again, if the farmer decides to do that, that's fine, he can, but he'll just get a lower payment. Uh, this is a margin, a two meter margin, which is what we would also be encouraging. Um, and that because the hedgerow itself is, a, is an extremely important habitat in its own right, but it's down on the margin area where you're going to get the, the wildflowers growing, which is what pollinating insects need. And if, you know, many of the farm I've been in recent, in the last year or such, and up to yesterday, you'd often have the, the wire fence right in at the hedge, and that's effectively, you know, cutting out your, that, that last little bit of available land for pollen, um, sorry, for, <coughs> for, for uh, wildflowers, etc. Because very few wildflowers actually grow inside the hedge because the hedge is, is effectively a miniature woodland with, with a lot of shade. So the, by, by far the best area to have wildflowers is in this margin. So that would be a big measure of ours as well that we're trying to uh, encourage. There's one of our new, he sorry, new hedges going in. Um, and <coughs> it's one of the unique features of the Bride Project, actually. Our hedgerow mix is based on this study done by Southwood and updated several times since. In Britain, I hasten, hasten to add, famous study in the 60s, uh, identifying which species of tree att attracted the most insects or associated insects or invertebrates, rather. And surprise, surprise, what comes first? Oak, all the way down to Holly actually is a very poor score, but um, sycamore, which is non-native, and when you uh, an awful lot of farmers, you know, can't understand why. It's not that we're opposed to beech and sycamore, but when we tr when we sh try and explain it from this perspective, if you're going to have a tree, and if you're going to plant a new tree, try and aim obviously for a native species, but we would particularly emphasize from the top seven or eight species there because you're going to have so many more insect species associated with native tree species than you will with um, the introduced. And look, here's, here's the good old Sitka. Not too bad, mind you, better than holly, but still, 
And this, this is Britain, and e even beech, which is a tree I've always admired and loved, beech are not native to Ireland. Um, so that score of 64 in Britain is from a country where they are native. So even where they are native, they don't tend to uh, bring in the, anything like the number of insect species that oak, willow, birch, hawthorn, etc. will. So our, our new little woodland patches will be comprised of a whole range of species. For the acidic soils, we have that list, and for the alkaline areas, we have these. A lot of these are actually quite rare uh, native Irish tree species, rare because they become rare. Um, the Irish landscape, as we all know, is, is extremely artificial. The only reason we have a lot of blackthorn and hawthorn is because they were the obvious choices for hedging uh, you know, when, when, he when the, the land was enclosed 200 years ago, um, they could easily have chosen some, some of the other species there, but they didn't. But as a consequence, the many of these species are now quite rare in Ireland. Dogwood, bird cherry, um, buckthorns, the white beams, very rare, very localised. So I like to see our, <laughs> the, our scheme, our project, as a tree reintroduction um, project also. And, and as, we have all, as we all know, the more variety you have, the more diversity you have, the more hetero heterogeneity you have, the more biodiversity you'll have. Bird cherry, just giving you an example of what it's like. Quite common up in Donegal and Tyrone, but very, very localised elsewhere. They are recorded from the, um, the Gira. It's the only known cork site. But a beautiful tree. And this is one of my little... Uh, I'm, I'm kind of deviating a little bit here now uh, from, from the, the intended course. But garden centres in Ireland, you can get a Japanese maple or a Chilean myrtle, but try finding a native Irish dogwood, bird cherry, alder buckthorn, very, very difficult. And I would encourage, if there's anybody here from the garden centre or knows of anybody, have a little section native Irish, Irish trees, because I think this will develop. These trees are absolutely beautiful. They do everything that any, <coughs> you know, ornamental uh, import will do, and they're of much, much higher biodiversity value. This is just one final example of um, the, the impact that a, a native tree species can have. The brimstone butterfly, relatively local, more or less confined to the Midlands and the east and west of the Midlands. Why is that? Because it's food plant, the buckthorn, and it, it feeds on both the buckthorn and the alder buckthorn. It's confined to that area. You won't find brimstone butterflies unless you have this tree. And that applies to a vast range of insect species uh, with native Irish tree species, native, native, you know. So bring in the, I'm not n saying that we're going to have brimstones all over the Bride Valley in the next few years, but we'll never have them if we don't have buckthorns. Um, there's one of our ripe, well, no, that's not one of ours. That's a two meter riparian buffer strip. We'll be trying to bring it out an extra meter in an attempt to, uh, prevent some of the, and even from that extra meter, we, we're emphasizing with farmers, and a few of them have said it to me, Asher, ah, sure, you know, when you put in your, and when you put in your riparian buffer strip, or more so your, your, your two meter field margin, sure, I'll give it an old lash of slurry there to help it on, and we'll say, <laughs> <laughs> and I've had to say to several of them, no, don't, we don't want any slurry anywhere near it, or any nitrogen, uh, but it's, you know, they, they're, they're keen to help, but it's, it's kind of the solution to everything. If you want growth, pour slurry on it. Uh, but not, not in this case. There's an example of native woodland, which will be, as I say, our little quarter acre patches on hopefully every farm. And you can, you can have more than one as well. Now, pond restoration, that's another big one. We'll be, we, this summer, we're hoping to put in at least 30 ponds on 30 different farms. This was an old pond that was in the process of being filled in. That, that counts too, so it'll be uh, re restoration, pond restoration, where, where there was a pond, but we'll be putting in new ponds where there were none. And that measure has been, has been taken up really enthusiastically, because it was one we pushed. There's also a higher payment for it, um, but, but I think most farmers are happy to have it, um, because it would have been, in many cases, we're dealing with the younger generation now, and it would have been their parents would have filled in the pond, or would have taken out the, the hedgerows, uh, so I'm not saying all of the younger guys are, are more amenable to, to our plans because we, we, it, it works on both sides. We have some of the, o the older guys, would say, you know, 50 plus, who kind of look back with regret to a certain degree as to the changes that they made 
on the land over the last 40 years or so. But as, as they'll all tell you, that's what they were told to do. That's what they were advised to do by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and that'll be the finished product, hopefully, on a lot of a lot of the a lot of the farms. We'll have to wait a while for that to develop, though. There's an example of the sprayed and unsprayed. So sprayed stubble, unsprayed stubble. Huge difference in the number of birds that will feed on those. Plus, shortly after spraying, this is pre-plowing. That that's plowed in the late autumn, early winter, and it becomes you know. Uh, uh, you've, you've got all the problems of siltation and everything flowing into the streams and, and, and then the river afterwards. But this is one that our cereal farmers are enthusiastically taking up as well because you're putting a value on that. There's no value on that, if you like, over the winter months. The only time it's, it, it's producing is when the crop is growing. Uh, so the farmers, naturally enough, is keen to uh, prepare the field as soon as he can. Whereas if you put, it, do, it doesn't, doesn't make a massive difference if that if if the ploughing is delayed for those extra few months, but it makes a huge difference to biodiversity. Uh, now, finally, invasive species—they seem to be one of the the bywords of this this conference. Um, we have two particularly nasty uh, examples on the bride: Himalayan balsam, which is pretty widespread and occurs from Glenville all the way down. Um, these were introduced, you know, in the old estates as exotic plants. Um, pretty, very pretty. In fact, the balsam is especially beautiful. Uh, but it, it's problematic from a number of fronts. It takes from the native. Na First of all, it, it just um, when it colonizes an area, it obliterates all, all of the native plants. And even those, it does. Bees find it more attractive, so the bees tend to go to this rather than pollinate the the, the native plants that are left. Uh, and then it dies off very quickly and leaves bare patches which are subject to erosion in the winter. Um, this one is an even uh, quite nasty, that's me there by the way, the giant hogweed, the size of it. And that's rampant from castle lions eastwards all the way down to the estuary. And again, we've, we're pretty sure we have the source of this. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be ironically easier to tackle that one because it's not as widespread, uh, but it's one, um, We'd say old estate, uh, where it was introduced as a as an exotic, and it's literally taken off now all along the Bride Valley, east of Castle Lyons. But we're with we've spoken to Cork County Council, and they're keen to cooperate on this one. Each farmer will be asked to. You're not obliged to, but each farmer who has on the river, because these both of these are largely confined to the rivers or the tributaries, will be asked to remove these, and we'll pay for the rodenticide and for sorry not rodenticide herbicide. Um, to do it and to, you know, they'll be scored each year then on whether or not they're making an effort with this. Uh, and Cork County Council are going, because there's no point in us doing it if the farmer who is not next door is not within, not participating in the Bright Project, you know, he's just going to seed the, the, the farm next to us. So Cork County Council are hopefully going to intervene and um, address the farmers who are not in the project. Uh, this is just a quick example of what we're doing. This is, this is being revised now, but it gives you an idea this is the red zone, orange zone, green zone, and say for a pond, you get 200, years, 200 euros a year for your pond if you're in the red zone, 350 if you're in the orange zone. And when I say you, we'll, we'll pay for the excavation of the pond, but you also get this results-based payment each year. And to manage your pond, you just prevent willow encroachment. It's important to have a small area of willow, but no more than 10% of the pond, according to a recent study. Because uh, ponds, if ponds become enclosed by trees, uh, the, the aquatic life of Pascal, I'm sure you'll be able to fill us in much more on that, uh, declines dramatically then with the shade. So it'll basically be, and to obviously to, to make sure that the, you know, to prevent succession really in the pond, you want to keep it as open as possible. So anyway, the pond mm -hmm. would be 200 for the red zone, 350 for the orange, and 500 if you're in the green zone. So it's an incentive to get into the green zone and get over that 10% biodiversity managed area. That's it. Thank you.